Hi, we're back with the COVID Sense series. This is a series of videos that tackles the data behind a lot of what we see and hear about COVID. In this September update, we'll update you on a number of aspects of COVID, including testing, natural immunity, and vaccine safety and efficacy. So let's talk about the phase three trials. Um, now, there are updated results that are available for these phase three trials, so it's probably worth revisiting. The phase three trials were both uh, the Moderna and the um, Pfizer trials basically were phase three randomized controlled placebo controlled trials, which is really what you want from a clinical trial. Um, and they had similar attributes. So let's just go over them really quickly. They were both done in healthy um, adults with no known history of COVID-19 with healthy immune systems. And for the most part, um, they might have been at high risk of exposure, but generally low risk of severe disease. So these were generally good uh, actors in the sense of healthy people. They were either given the vaccine or the placebo, a first and a second dose, about two to three weeks apart. Uh, and then they waited one to two weeks for antibodies to be produced, and then they tested or assessed for COVID positivity, which was basically defined as a positive PCR test and two symptoms. So the fact that they were looking for symptoms might have been an indicator of an active infection. And the fact that they had the PCR test probably means that it was active. Let's talk about phase three trials. Six months data is available for these phase three trials now, so it's worth revisiting them. So both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines uh, had phase three trials that were conducted. They were large. They were randomized. They were placebo controlled. So there's a lot of good things that were similar in design. Um, they were both conducted in healthy adults for the most part, with no known history of COVID-19 with healthy immune systems. Uh, and for the most part, uh, they might have been at a higher risk of exposure, but generally low risk of severe disease. Now, both studies uh, introduced two doses of the mRNA vaccine, a dose uh, separated by two to three weeks. Uh, they waited two, one to two weeks, and then they started testing for uh, the vaccine's ability to prevent COVID positive infections, which were defined as PCR uh, positive tests and two symptoms. Um, generally speaking, the early medium follow-up was about four months and we had data on two to 0.6 months or two and a half months. And now we have up to six months of data, but mostly it's about a median follow-up of four months. Um, now, one of the things to remember is that these studies were not powered, meaning they didn't have enough events or people to be able to make any definitive claims around disease severity, use of medical resources, or death. And they were also not designed uh, to assess whether these mRNA vaccines could stop the spread of the disease. So even though there's a lot of talk and people throw around this whole term of they're able to reduce severe disease or e even stop the spread of disease, uh, these were actually things that we can't prove within the context of the phase three trials that were conducted. There were also a number of other shortcomings uh, with respect to these phase three trials that are worth noting. So the first thing is that this whole notion of vaccinating in the middle of a, vac of a pandemic is a break in good medical protocol. Uh, there's many uh, experts in virology and immunology that basically say that this is something that shouldn't be done because it can drive um, the uh, selection of variants. And so it is possible that some of the variants or the the increased rate of variants that we're seeing are because we're vaccinating in the middle of a pandemic, usually want to vaccinate in a population that isn't being pressured by disease. I think the other thing that we want to think about is that the choice of the control arm was placebo and nothing, whereas we now know that natural immunity and even natural immunity and treatment are a much better option. Uh, and so the vaccine should have been compared to these. And so at this point, we really don't know how the vaccine compares to natural immunity and treatment. Um, and really, the vaccine should be tested against those to see, uh, because those would be, I would say, the standard of care leading up to vaccination. So most of the people had natural immunity, and it was strong and long lasting. So the, the vaccine really should have been compared to that rather than nothing at all. Um, the study was not powered to address important outcomes. Again, we talked about the fact that it wasn't able to make definitive claims around severe disease, use of medical resources, or death. 
and definitely not uh, stop the spread of the disease. And in fact, now the manufacturers have all agreed that uh, it is not able to stop the spread of the disease, that uh, vaccinated people can spread uh, the virus just as easily as unvaccinated people. And then there's a couple other things that I think that we should note, and these are things that we consider when we're interpreting data, is that there con there's a conflict of interest with the NIH, which are basically um, the group that's setting policy in the US and that much of the Western world is following. And the NIH, uh, it's been purported that they've funded gain of function research. So they may very well have been responsible uh, for at least in some part, the pandemic actually occurring. And they also co-own Moderna patent shares. So if they, they may have a vested interest or a conflicting interest in uh, you know, having people be vaccinated versus uh, natural immunity, for instance, because they will benefit from it, they'll, they'll gain monetarily. And the last thing that I think is very suspicious about these studies that wasn't actually apparent at the time of our last review is that uh, shortly after the publication of the last results, they unblinded the trial. What that means is that people who were in the placebo arm could cross over and get the vaccine. And basically what that does is it pretty much nullifies the trial. It makes it so that uh, any long-term outcomes that we might want to have or insights that we might have relative to efficacy or, uh, or even safety, especially safety, are basically eliminated because we have no more, we no longer have a control arm. Uh, so this is very uh, beneficial for a manufacturer, vaccine manufacturer, because it basically means that there's no way of proving any long-term uh, safety or efficacy issues. Therefore, there are very limited liability in terms of um, you know, any side effects that might occur, either short or long-term. They, they can't be pegged on the vaccine anymore because the randomized control trials were stopped. All right. Let's take a look at these outcomes, these six month outcomes that were purported. So again, I mentioned in the last slide that the outcomes were actually not for six months, it's between four to six months. So that's why it says through to six months. Um, although the trials have been ongoing for much longer, I'm not really sure why they're not reporting more long-term outcomes. Um, they looked at, or they reported cases, um, severe cases and deaths in terms of events. And then they also talked about any adverse events and severe adverse events. And so what, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the outcomes. So I've summarized them here in this table. We've got the outcomes for the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine here and the placebo here. And it's just the difference between the two groups. So when it comes to cases, they were able to lower, this is the primary endpoint, they were actually able to lower the number of cases. So we have 77 here in the uh, vaccine arm and 850 here in the placebo arm for a difference of minus 773. Um, so one would say that that's good and probably quite effective. However, uh, when we look at the adverse events, which were actually COVID-like symptoms, we realized that there were many more people on the vaccine arm who had COVID-like symptoms, just not a PCR test, on this arm versus the placebo arm here, which is 1,311 for a difference of plus 3,930. So if you consider the COVID-like symptoms here that had a positive PCR test versus the COVID-like symptoms here without a positive PCR test, you can see that the net uh, level number of people with disease was actually greater in the vaccine arm than it was in the placebo arm. Let's take a look at severe disease. So we have severe cases here. There was only one on the Pfizer arm and 23 on the placebo arm for a difference of 22, a reduction in 22 cases, which was not statistically significant. Uh, however, when you look at severe adverse events, there were 262 severe adverse events on the vaccine arm and only 150 on the placebo arm for an increase of 112. So net, we would say that there's 100 more cases of severe disease on the vaccine arm than there would be on the placebo arm. Finally, when we look at deaths from all causes, we see that there were 15 deaths on the vaccine arm and 14 on the placebo arm, meaning that the vaccine actually caused an increase of one death. So if we were to try and think about what these vaccines are doing in terms of efficacy, I would have to say that they're probably not that good.
Okay, so let's talk about one other aspect of the phase three trials that really is relevant when we come to this, the topic of mandates or vaccine mandates. Now, one of the ways that they've uh, presented these vaccines is they're safe and effective uh, and they should be used in everyone. When we're talking about vaccine mandates, there's very few situations where you can get a medical exemption. And that's very concerning for me, and I'm going to explain why. These phase three trials for which we have evidence of benefit, uh, if you have a positive PCR test, and maybe less benefit if you don't have a positive PCR test, um, were, sh were conducted in healthy adults. Therefore, technically speaking, you can only extrapolate those results to healthy adults, and you should not be extrapolating them to any other population. Um, and if you do, it's based on a low level of evidence fueled mostly by speculation rather than actual data. So populations that we should not be extrapolating to are those who are immunocompromised and have multiple comorbidities. Although many would say that these are the populations at greater risk, therefore they should be used in these populations, the data actually doesn't support that. And we should be very cautious in thinking that a vaccine that works well in healthy adults who have low levels of inflammation would work well in people who are immunocompromised or have higher levels of inflammation if the vaccine itself induces inflammation. Let's think about teens, children, and pregnant women. Um, although there was uh, additional phase three trials that were conducted in teens and children, the number of people in those trials was very low. Uh, for the pregnant women, they were not included at all in the trials. And therefore, we really have to be careful trying to extrapolate the phase three study results to these populations. Let's talk about frail elderly people. Um, these vaccines are very toxic um, and frail elderly people are very fragile. Uh, although we might think that they're at higher risk of severe disease due to their age, uh, they're at risk of severe adverse events uh, because these vaccines are actually quite toxic. So to use them or to just take the phase three trials and then use them in frail elderly people is really not a good idea and it's not soundly supported by data. Let's think about COVID recovered. We now know that natural immunity is robust and long lasting, and yet we're still recommending vaccination in these patients and they weren't included in this trials whatsoever. So we have absolutely no data no quality data to support that decision. Um, so I think that in terms of people who are thinking about whether they should get vaccinated, if you were in one of these groups, there is very little good evidence to say that these vaccines would benefit you. And so you should really think carefully. And our medical system should give their head a good shake and make sure that anybody in these populations would get a medical exemption just based on the fact that they've been poorly studied or they weren't represented at all in the clinical trials. Well, that's all that we have for today. Thank you very much for listening to this uh, series of videos on the September update. Uh, we really strive to provide you with a solid evidence in everyday language. So if you like what we're doing, please share our videos, uh, subscribe to our channel, and you can also follow us on Rumble, um, Twitter, and send us an email. I'll have all of that contact information in the notes section. So thanks very much and have a great evening.